very well. I just made myself a new pot of coffee in order to be wide awake for this class. So you'll appreciate it. It's okay if the it's okay if students yawn occasionally. It's not okay if the instructor yawns during the lecture because yawning is contagious and that's probably not a good place to go. So, you know, we were talking about deep fakes. Remember the picture that I used on deep fakes that I where, where I showed you those pictures and kind of some of the outliers. Um, and, you know, Microsoft and Facebook and Amazon started a contest. Oh, it was a couple of years ago, I think, for not a contest, but a challenge for people to detect deep fakes, deep fake videos, deep, deep fake um, um, deep, deep fake images. And nobody has done it so far. So people are still plowing into this and it's still, it's still an open question. I have a stu we, we, I have a student that we're starting to look at right now, and I don't know if it'll go anywhere because there's lots of very smart people looking at this, trying to debunk um, fake, fake, uh, fake stuff. But let me um, let me ask you a question here. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. This is kind of a history, if you will, of deep fakes. I want to share my screen and see if see what you think. Now, these were pictures taken in 2000 or no, 1917. And they were taken by a couple of British cousins. And these British cousins, um, you know, they, they, they were pictures of these British cousins with fairies. And these fairies had wings on them. And uh, they were known as a, the something something fairies. I forget what it was, but let me show you some of the pictures and see what you think, and see what you think of uh, forensics of old, of older stuff. So, can you see my Wikipedia page here? Okay, these were perused by no more than Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Who's heard of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? What did he do? Yeah, Trevor. Wasn't he the author of the Sherlock Holmes books? Yeah, he was the author of the Sherlock Holmes books, but he was also into spiritualism and he wanted to believe there were things like fairies. So he got a hold of this picture and he wrote this, um, this thing. Let's see, I think it's on the Wikipedia. Yeah, here it is. Uh, fairies photographed and he says that this is really compelling evidence that there do does exist fairies so this was published um, published many years ago so let's take a look at some of these uh, photos and see if you can detect what the problem is okay let's first of all look at this one these were two cousins I don't want more details. How do I get rid of you? I don't know how to get rid of them. Yeah, I guess I just do that. These were pictures taken in 2000 or 1917 by a couple of British cousins. And uh, this is this is one of the photos. Does this look real or fake to you? Just your opinion. Now, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle thought they were for real. They kind of look like little ceramic figurines. They do look like ceramic figurines. I will tell you that Doyle took them to some uh, photography experts, and they examined the picture to see if anybody had tinkered with the photographic plates, which is what they used at the time, and he found no evidence of it. And so these were really big deals back then so that was one of them there were a series of these pictures which these girls released and i'll show you another one here yeah this is one okay so sam's pretty close it does look like figurines doesn't it and this stumped people until the early 1980s, when the two cousins came out and confessed that they were indeed fakes. <laughs> Nobody knew up until then, which to me is really amazing because they certainly look fake to me. Uh, this one is telling one of the things, if you can see it, is that the fairy, no, this isn't it, this isn't it. 
Okay, let's see if I can find the one that I wanted to show you. Yeah, this is the one. One of the takeaways to these, um, the, these fairies is notice the fashion style. The fashion style is around the turn of the century, right? So why would fairies have the same fashion style around that area? So the question is, how do you think they did it? I think a figurine would be too heavy to put on a, um, to put on a little leaf like this. Anybody guess how they did it when they confessed? String? What's that? Was it string? No, they didn't. No, they didn't use a string to hang them up by by the roof. No, actually, they went to a child's book and they saw they found pictures of fairies. And one of the girls, one of the cousins was pretty good with art. And she sketched these fairies out and she added wings to them. And these are actually cardboard cutouts. And they were held in place by hat pins. So this is an interesting early fake. Okay, um, let's see if I can give you another one. 20, 20 years later, they came up with uh, another fake one, and you might have seen this one. Uh, let's see if I can. I, I thought I had it queued up, but I don't. Uh, man hunting grasshopper. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. It could have been you've seen this before. Anybody ever seen this photo? It's kind of cool. It's a picture of a man with a shotgun that just took out a big grasshopper. This was uh, th this picture was taken in 1937. It was uh, appeared on a number of postcards, and it became a best-selling postcard because people thought it was really cool. Uh, can you look at this and tell forensically why it was fake? This is obviously faked, right? There's no grasshoppers this big. One of the obvious things is the shadows. And this is, this is the first thing to look at in some of these manipulated photos is the consistency of the shadows. The sun shining from the right to the left is obvious because you do have the grasshopper illuminated that way. So they got that right. And the man is illuminated with the sun at his, at his right over on, can you see my cursor? Okay, over on this side, the sun is coming in from this side, as you can see by the long shadow down here. But what is telling is that there's no shadow of the grasshopper on the man's pants leg. You do see a little piece of a shadow here, and that's the original shadow from the man's arm. So there's the original shadow of the man's arm right here, but there is no shadow of the grasshopper. And grasshoppers are not vampires, so they do cast a shadow. So this is certainly um, the, the forensics for detecting fake photographs and videos has been pretty easy. In fact, there were professors that ran little consulting businesses that did forensics on photographs until uh, AI GAN generated deep fakes. And they would look at this, they would look at for discontinuities in the, in the pixels, um, you know, shadows, I think is, is one of the, one of the things that you immediately look at. And <clears throat> they were able to do this. And when called upon, they could testify in a court of law. So I thought this was interesting. This is kind of the background. And this, this, this shows that deep fakes, not deep fakes, fakes, not so deep fakes have been around for a long time. And these deep fakes are really realistic and thus far has escaped they have escaped detection, except for those weird ones that I showed you. Remember with the weird, weird lady in the upper left-hand corner? Uh, so those occur occasionally. Now, what happens here, as we talked about last time, is the 
way that this works is you have some training data and you can imagine a, you, I, I've explained this, but let me go over it again. You have this humongous space of data and this humongous space of data contains every image that was ever made. You know, random noise, picture your grandmother, picture of toe fungus, uh, pictures of doors and houses and cars and everything else. Now, what you would like to do in some sense is you would like to identify a small region uh, in which there are people with faces, human faces. And so you take a few samples and you attempt to define that space. Then what the GAN does, when the, the GAN, the generative adversarial network, it, what, what it does is that it looks at this data and it interpolates between them or among the different uh, instantiations and uh, is able to give you these wonderful, wonderful, incredible deep fakes. So we have to ask ourselves from the viewpoint of somebody like uh, Lovelace, the Lovelace test for creativity, are these images which are generated by deep fakes, are they, are they creative? Well, not by the Lovelace test because the computer program is doing exactly what it was designed to do. And so any creativity that goes into the results of the software uh, has a source of the programmer and not the program itself. The program cannot be creative. I maintain that no AI or no computer um, program itself can be created. They're going to give you surprising results, sometimes unexpected results, but indeed the results aren't going to be creative. Okay. It doesn't pass the Lovelace test for creativity. Okay. Let's... Um, Let's go on and uh, let me share my screen again, and uh, we'll go back to the slides that we were using. Okay, where is it? There it is. Okay. Okay, here we have, is that covering your whole screen, by the way? No? Okay, let me... Uh... Let me go into the presentation mode then. Okay, we've already addressed whether AI can create music. And again, the idea of AI creating music goes back to the same thing about the, um, uh, about the creativity of, of the, the deep fakes on the website, this person does not exist.com. Um, if you want to create a music that sounds Baroque, you generate a lot of Bach uh, music and um, Handel, Handel was Baroque, wasn't he? Anybody know? Handel was Baroque. Okay, so maybe some Handel stuff, stuff of that period. Now notice, roughly in the set of all music, you're defining a subset of that music, right? And then that subset of that music, once the AI gets a hold of it, can interpolate among the different pieces and generate something that possibly sounds like Baroque music or a Bach composition. And again, you're not going to get out anything that sounds like, um, um, sounds like Wagner or um, Charles Ives, who is one of my favorites. Anybody ever listen to Charles Ives besides me? I meet very few people that have. If you want some of the weirdest, strangest music in the world, listen to Charles Ives. Um, he, he's on YouTube if you're interested. Okay, so uh, can AI create music? No, it can only interpolate. Can AI create art? This was uh, Sir, what, Sir Arthur Bellamy, and this was the first element or the first painting that was generated by AI. Now, getting back to those fake fairy pictures, Guess what? They sold in uh, a few years back for over 20,000 pounds. The original photographs sold for 20,000 pounds at auction. And um, I don't know what that is, something like 20, 26,000, I think, US dollars, roughly. And so they sold for a heck of a lot. Why? Because they were just beautifully generated fakes. No, they had historical, they had a historical significance. And much of the significance of art can come from its um, can come from its historical significance. Let me ask you this: this this is a very interesting question. Okay, you have a 
original painting by Rembrandt. Multi-million dollar painting. Then you're able to duplicate that atom by atom so that you have an exact replication of that painting. Is that okay? All the molecules are exactly the same. The only difference is on the back of the original, you have the original on the back of the copy, you have something called copy. Molecule by molecule, it's exactly the same. Do you think that the replication atom by atom would be as valuable as the original? No, I, I wouldn't think so. Why? They're exactly the same, but it's the emotional connection to the artist. It's the emotional connection to Rembrandt. It's the emotional connection to the history of what is going on that makes the thing valuable. It isn't the art itself. And you need to, um, you need to uh, get away from from that when evaluating whether art is good or not. So one of the reasons that this picture sold was because it was the first. And guess what happened? Everybody thought, wow, this, this picture sold for, I think it was a little less than a half a million dollars at auction. And people thought, oh my goodness, um, boy, if this one sold for a half a million, let me crank out a few more. Because this was generated, this was produced using a GAN, a generative um, adversarial network. And if this sold for a half a million, wouldn't the next one sell for a half a million? No, you know what they tried to do? They generated a bunch more paintings and none of them sold for what this original one sold for, even though they were probably more appealing in my mind. And it was because of the historical significance of this that it sold for a little under a half million dollars. It wasn't the art itself. Art in itself cannot be appreciated without emotional contact. Did I tell you about clacking last time? No? Okay. The, 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 this shows the importance of the emotional connection with the artist and the impact that the history and the emotion has on your appreciation of art. In uh, the 18th century opera houses and theaters in Europe, they had a, they had a practice called clacking, C-L-A-Q-U-E. Uh, they, they would call it the clack. And what would happen is there would be these paid people in the audience. And at the end of the, at, at the, end of the performance, one of them would jump up, one of the clackers would jump up and go, bravo, and start clapping real hard. Then another one would jump up and go, bravo, and then a third and a fourth. And pretty soon everybody was joining them because of the emotional connection. Well, guess what happened to the reviews when there was clacking? The reviews of the opera or the theater performance shot up because it was a shared emotion generated by these clackers, which I think is, 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 is very interesting. In fact, it became so popular that agents started to take over. You had clacker agents. And so if you want your performance clacked, you could, you could go to this agent and say, okay, I need, I need some different people. I, I, need, I need some clackers. And they specialized. There were the there were the people that jumped up at the end and went that went bravo bravo. There were the people during the performance. If they told a joke, somebody, a few of the clackers might break out in a big belly laugh. Some of the other ones might pad their eyes, uh, uh, wipe away tears during the sad part of the performance, and just sob audibly in order to make it more um, more realistic and they had french names for all of these things but you could you know you could you could make some extra buck as a clacker and it'd be a fun way to make work make money wouldn't it because you got to go to all these performances so today we don't have clackers but you know what we do have we have promoters we have uh, producers and we have publicists and these are the modern day clackers and you cannot you cannot get anywhere, no matter how good you are, without some sort of clacking or somebody being a clacker for you, a promoter for you. It just doesn't work. If you write a song, your song just doesn't, um, just doesn't go viral. Isn't there the chance it'll go viral? Yeah, but it's kind of the same probability of getting hit by space debris while you're juggling or something like that. It's a really small probability. 
what about writing a book and self-publishing it? Will that ever go viral? Uh, no. You have to have you have to have a good publishing house with good publicity. You have to have an agent, and you have to have representation. And that's the only way that you make it in the arts. It's the same same way with all the pop singers, right? You have to have promotions. You have to sign with a label. So anyway, that that's the point about the value of the art. You look at this and you think this is kind of good. I think I mentioned last time that this was trained with a bunch of paintings by Rembrandt, another famous artist, um, fa other famous portrait artists. Now, that's what happened. So you identified the space of all paintings of these classical Rembrandt things, and then you, you, you pick one out, interpolate it in some fashion, and it came out to be this. I don't know this for sure, but I would be willing to wager, if I was a person to bet, that none of, none of the works of, uh, what was his name? The guy that made his living splashing paint Pollock, I think. Anybody know? No, you don't know. Okay, you, you've seen these these paintings. They made they made, they made a biopic of him where he went around and he took all this paint and splashed it on a canvas, and everybody thought it was great. Or Picasso in his cubism. You've seen the cubism of Picasso, where he has all these strange shapes. None of those were used in the training of this neural network. The only thing they used is things which they wanted to mimic and inclusion of any of these things, such as a Picasso or a Jason Pollock is, is the name that is, I don't know if that's true, but um, uh, none of those paintings were used in the generation of these pictures. Neither were pictures of bowls and bowls of fruit, neither were pictures of a meadow or a, uh, an open garden scene, none of those were used in the generation of this because those would really muddy out, muddy the result. One of the things that's very interesting is that um, things get keep getting rediscovered in artificial intelligence. Rediscovered, that's a sad part, rediscovered without reference, but also rediscovered and made better because we have more computing power. If you watch that Bernie Woodrow film, I think Sam uh, mentioned that he watched it, and you saw what Bernie Woodrow's original AI in the 1960s did, including speech recognition, balancing brooms. He was able to forecast the weather. He was able to train it to play blackjack to a near optimal performance. That was a case where they knew what the optimal performance was. This is in the 1960s. Now we've improved on this, of course, but we have more difficult games than blackjack. We went up to checkers and then chess and then go. But you know the the idea of, of using AI to solve games is 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 kind of old. It's the same thing with art. Um, uh, and I want to show you something that I did with a guy named Dennis Sar back in 1991. So that was. Sam helped me out here 30 years ago. <laughs> is that right? I screwed it up last time. Okay, what he did is he used a neural network and he trained it with a bunch of things, including his two daughters. Now you'll notice the low resolution of the image. The reason the image is low resolution is why. It's because that's the computing power that we had back then, right? We couldn't, we couldn't use highly defined pixelated images. So this was one of Dennis's daughters. This was another one. We trained the neural network and we seeded it with the bottom half of one of the images and the top half with the other one. Is that okay? And then we wanted to see what the neural network would do when it filled it in, when it interpolated among the top and the bottom half. Now, these weren't the only images that were used to train the neural network. There was a bunch of others, but these are the ones we focused on. Well, here's, here's the result. These, these were the iterations, and the person we got out on the bottom right here looks like a little demon girl, doesn't it? With little, little black eyes and things like that. But that created a, out, of, out of nothing. Was the neural network creative? No, because we, we, had, we were trying to do this with, um, we were trying to do this with, uh, well, mi minimal resources. And the neural network did exactly what we intended it to do. So it wasn't creative. All the creativity came from Dennis Sar under my direction. And also Seho O, who is uh, 
one, one of the greatest PhD students I've ever had. Just, just a remarkable guy. And uh, so here's another example from my book, uh, the Handbook of Fourier Analysis and its Applications. We duplicate the neural network in there and did the following. We took, uh, we took pictures of a bunch of different people and uh, we seeded the neural network with my nose. And this is the image that we came up with. In other words, we, we listed a bunch of famous mathematicians and we seeded it with just a picture of my nose. And we wanted to see how it would interpolate all of these great mathematicians. Unfortunately, I was not in the list of the greatest mathematicians of all time. So I wasn't in the list. So it had to, it had to combine those images. So we came out with the image on the right which is eh, kind of interesting, okay? So one of the things you have to do in art also is to properly name it. I think this was, this was Ralph Bellamy. And um, this one, it kind of looks like he's wearing headphones. And I think we were gonna name it Gunther Benchley Endures Rap because he has kind of a sour look in his face. And we wanted to see if we can auction it off. Unfortunately, I've had no no takers. So, um, so can AI create art? No, it can only interpolate among the art for which it was trained. Uh, can uh, AI write screenplays? This is the. <laughs> Anybody recognize this guy? His name is uh, uh, Middle Ditch, I think, or something like that. He's been on a bunch of movies, including um, the, one of the latest King Kong movies he was in. And uh, he had a Netflix series, very short-lived, where he did improvisation with this other guy. And uh, it didn't last too long. But he's, a, he's, a, he's an incredibly talented actor. So the headlines here, movie written by algorithm turns out to be hilarious and intense. Now, can you have, can you have algorithms, AI, write screenplays? You can, but they should be, um, uh, they, they, yeah, they, but, they, but the best ones are written by AI that uses so-called expert systems, rule-based systems. When you totally train a neural network, it doesn't do that well. It turns out here that emotional connection is what makes the art really great. This guy is an incredible actor and the production values on it were really incredible. But the material they started to work with was frankly terrible. They trained with a bunch of screenplays with a number of different, um, uh, screenplays with a number of different uh, titles, probably like Alien and Aliens and a bunch of other sci-fi. So here's an excerpt from the screenplay. So I watched the video and then I dug deep on the net and I found out the, the transcript. The transcript, is that what they don't call it the transcript? The script for the play. And here was the script for the play. Whoops, oh, no. Oh, I don't have it here. Oh boy. Okay, what am I have to do? Okay, ah, I thought there was more here, uh, but it turns out it was just, it, it was really inane. The script was inane, but it was the acting and the production values, the added music, plus guess what they did? The same thing they do with GPT-3 in some of the, some of the cases, they go in and they edit it. They take out something, they put in something in order to make it more coherent. Um, this was over 50 years ago at MIT. This is a more successful way of writing screenplays, and it was used using an expert system. Remember what an expert system was as opposed to a neural network? An expert system was something that, that you followed a bunch of rules. In other words, you had a decision tree over time. And over 50 years ago, uh, they did they did some things at MIT, and I'm going to play this for you. And um, these are a few of the plays which were written by this AI at MIT over 50 years ago. Now, the interesting thing, over 50 years ago, the big thing on television was Westerns. The television series Gunsmoke started in 1955 and ran for 20 years 
For a long time, it was the longest running primetime television program of all time. I think it's been beaten by Law and Order now and also The Simpsons and probably a bunch of other ones. But uh, when Gunsmoke premiered, it was the only Western on TV. And then later, I think in 1961, if I remember right, there were, there were like 36 primetime Westerns on the three channels. There were only three channels back then. And there were, there, there were just gluts of them. So Westerns were very prominent at that time. So this is Saga and original, whoop, you know what? It, ju it just occurred to me, I'm not sharing my sound. So I need to I need to share my screen with the sound. Okay, let's see if this works. and get big. There we go. Can you see my screen? Okay, I'm, I'm assuming you can. I, everybody went away. Are you guys still there? Yeah. Yes. No, we're done. Okay, can you, okay, let me, um, <laughs> I hope you're not disappointed with all the problems we have here. Oh, this is going to be such a letdown with all this buildup. Okay, what'd you think? Kind of corny, huh? But uh, I don't know if you noticed the actors, but the first one, I've seen a, a lot of old movies as a character actor. So they hired some very good people at MIT. But the way that the AI worked, it was kind of like, um, it was a flow graph with some random branches. So you could generate different plots depending on uh, coin flips as you went down. And this works out a lot better than than, um, than the result generated by AI. Let me, let me go back here. I do have it. It's, the slides are just out of focus. Okay, here is the excerpt that I thought I had. It was, it, it, anyway, this is an excerpt from the script. 
He is standing in the stars and sitting on the floor. He takes a seat on the counter and pulls the camera over to his back. He stares at it. He is on the phone. He cuts the shotgun from the edge of the room and puts it in his mouth. He sees a black hole in the floor leading to the man on the roof. He comes up from behind to protect him. He is still standing next to him. He looks through the door and the door closes. He looks at the bag from his backpack and starts to cry. What do you think about that? Pretty cool, huh? Let's see if, uh, yeah, let's see if I can play that for you. Now, I'm going to play the same, the same part of the clip. I'm not playing the whole thing. And I want you to know how this totally inane script is acted out well by the actors. It's enhanced by the musical background and the uh, editing. And by the way, there was a lot of editing from the original transcript written by the AI. And then I left the other two. I was a boy, I was a stranger And I promised to be so happy I was a beautiful day, I was tall and tall I just wanted to tell you that I was much better than he did I had to stop him, I couldn't even tell truth was so long ago There's the black hole. the situation with me and the life okay what do you think uh, didn't the uh, wasn't the acting good the production values the background music and it made that totally inane script into something which kind of looked meaningful but it was total gibberish now can ai do better in the future yeah i think so I think that it can do better in the future. I think as uh, guided by GPT-3, for example, I think uh, that it might be better. One of the things that in these generative text sort of things where we are going to find a lot of use, I believe, as a tool, and that's true for probably most of AI, it'll be used as a tool for us. The AI itself cannot be creative, but it has it does things a lot quicker and gives us more options than um, than if we were to do it, do it by hand. So again, it's going to be a tool. It's not going to be an end, end uh, everything. Okay, let me go back here to this. Dum, da, dum. Okay. Okay. I know. I know what happened there. By the way, I because I, because I optimized the video, it cut out your pictures. So can AI write screenplays thus far? No good. Um, now, let's see if I can remember. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I think that I might try this. Hold on. No. Okay. There, there came out something called SciGen, which used artificial intelligence, a rule-based system, in order to write computer science papers. And that turns out, unfortunately, not to be online anymore. Uh, something, something crashed there. But there is another one called um, MathGen. And so we're going to talk about math, Jen, here just for a second. Where are you at? Okay. Okay, so hopefully you can see the screen, which is math, Jen. Now, what this does is it, um, you can choose some author's names. So let's use Robert Marks. 
Let's use uh, innocent. Anybody else like to be an author? Can you throw uh, Paul Erdish in there? Oh, okay. By the way, you know, I have an Erdish number of three. Are you impressed? Okay, good. You should be impressed. Impressed. <laughs> you should be impressed with Erdish. Okay. Uh, innocent. Uh, where are you at? Paul Erdish. Unfortunately, I don't know how to do, you know, the, the O in Erdish's name is not an umlaut. It's, it's something different, but uh, we'll put Paul Erdish. And uh, since Colin spoke up, I'll put his name in here. Oops, sorry. Okay, you got it? So you specify, uh, you specify this and uh, you hit generate and it gives you a PDF, which is a math file. And each one is totally different. Measurable, simply partial green modes over measurable matrices. Now you start reading this and since you're not a specialist in math, it starts to sound pretty good, doesn't it? What do you think? You know, it, it's not bad, but anybody with an expertise in mathematics, the closer they look at this, the more they realize it's, it's gibberish. And it goes down, and I don't know if it does it here, but the SciGen papers used to generate their own figures. And this generates, you know, theorems and conclusions. Every student is aware that every co-positive continuous algebraic monoid is co-universally symmetric and extrinsic. This was reduces the result of five to standard techniques of absolute knot theory. Here, uncountably, is trivially a concern. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's just beautiful. Go to that, man. Uh, it's called, um, well, you, I, I guess I can just send you the, uh, the thing in the chat. Let's see if I have the chat. Well, I should probably go back. So let me go back. And by the way, if you don't like this one, I just sent it to you in the chat if you'd like to check it out later. Uh, let's uh, take out me and put in a famous name, okay? So we're going to put in a famous name. So they probably have a list of uh, famous names. So we're going to generate it. It's going to be a totally different paper. Extrinsic vector spaces and advanced fuzzy representation theory. Oh, Kolmogorov. Okay, we talked about Kolmogorov, a little bit about Kolmogorov information theory. So Casey Kolmogorov, innocent, you're, you're, you're in good company there, Paul Erdos and uh, Colin. So let us assume we are given characteristic Hall A bar. It has, a, what, what the heck is that? See, if you didn't know it, characteristic Hall, you probably think, you know, I'm stupid because that comes from a different area that I've never been concerned with, that I don't know about. I haven't studied it. So it probably is okay. But I think any legit mathematician with a depth of education is going to read this. And the more you read it, the more you realize it's just totally nonsense. And we go down and this one doesn't generate figures, unfortunately. Uh, but let's let's look at the references. Even the references are made. For example, there's a reference here to Descartes. How many know who Descartes was? The philosopher, mathematician, founder of Cartesian coordinates, and uh, really great guy. Um, oh, look at that! Not Albert, but U. H. Einstein. I don't know who that is. I think L. Ito is the founder of Ito calculus. Uh, yeah, there's there's Erdos, but this is not Paul Erdos, it's you Erdos. So in other words, it makes up all of the references, everything, and it's just beautiful. Now, you might think that this is really stupid, but in MathGen, 
no, I'm sorry, SciGen, S-C-I-G-E-N. If you Google SciGen, you'll go to the page where it generates papers like this, except in computer science. Unfortunately, those fake papers are, are no longer generated. The, the, the site has crashed some way. But here's the interesting part. There have been people who have downloaded downloaded SciGen papers and submitted them to IEEE conferences, to Springer conferences, and sometimes they're accepted for publication. Just because the reviewers don't know what the heck that they're talking about. So if you're external to the field, you read this and you think, well, yeah, gosh, the guy sure knows what he's, what he, he's talking about. He's a lot smarter than me. And therefore, we must, we must accept it. So this was discovered by IEEE and Springer, and they purged all of these papers. And um, so, so they did find it out, but it wasn't until a few years later that they did find it out. And it was very embarrassing to them because IEEE and Springer, they, they present themselves as these great scholarly venues. IEEE is the greatest publishing in electrotechnology in the world and the most trusted and the most ubiquitous. Uh, but no, they published, they published papers from, um, from SciGen. So uh, interestingly, some of these are generated by um, this expert system. I don't know if you've ever played the game where you have three columns of three columns of, of phrases and you pick something from the first column, the second column and the third column, and it makes up a sentence. And then you pick something else from the first column, the second column, and the third column, and it makes a sentence. Have you ever seen that? Any, any of you played that game? Sam has, Innocent has. If I remember, I'll, I'll show you this next time. It's kind of like that. There are, some, there are some rules which math gen is used in order to generate these phrases. And they're just like, well, they're not just like, but they're akin to the same AI expert system that wrote that Western software. It's a bunch of rules, if then rules with a bunch of randomness to let you go different places. So really fascinating stuff. Okay, let's go on. That's, a, that's enough for that. Uh, I guess the bottom line is, is that uh, thus far, at least to me, that expert system AI, such as MathGen, can generate much more coherent uh, screenplays. Let's see, MathGen. Well, let me say this. You can generate something using akin to math gen, an expert system, but the expert systems look to be doing very well, whereas the AI really hasn't reached that breadth. Even, even GPT-3, once you, once you get back after a page or two pages, it just starts to fall apart. And you can read it, and just like the math gen papers, you can see, oh, man, this, this is not making sense. That's my opinion. So you can, you can look and get your own opinions here. Okay, let's go back and uh, start talking more about, um, let's get back to the slides here. Okay, we're 50 years ago at MIT, and then we have uh, Sunspring. Yeah, if you want to look this up, you can put Sunspring in YouTube, and you can watch the whole thing. It's all available on YouTube. Okay, Ken, um, We've talked about things such as qualia and how it's not algorithmic. Uh, there's a few things that, in my mind, are still open problems in AI. One is common sense. It could be someday AI will have common sense. How we're going to get there, I don't know. But I can see maybe a workaround of common sense. Remember the ambiguous phrases, such as uh, Fred Flintstone saying, when, when I nod my head, hit it right? There was an ambiguity there. I think that maybe someday AI will, AI will be able to do that. We're not there yet, but maybe it won't. I, I don't know. I don't know. One of the big things that's happening now is asking whether is consciousness algorithmic. Before you talk about this, you have to define what consciousness is. Anybody want to give a guess at defining consciousness? <laughs> Okay, I see a smile and a shake of a head. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I'm conscious. I'm not sure about you. Uh, in other words, I cannot prove that you're conscious. Um, I could gather evidence for it, I suppose, but uh, that's kind of uh, that's kind of strange stuff. So, 
this this is uh, another thing that if you you're not you're not careful people can use seductive semantics to suck you in and to to defend whatever position they're at so we're going to kind of do that <laughs> i'm going to suck you in by not defining it there's one uh, one thought of uh, consciousness which is called panpsychism anybody heard of panpsychism okay panpsychism is a popular Okay, I want to make my screen big. And I stopped in mid-sentence. Um, that posits that everything material, however small, has an element of individual consciousness. So your chair has a degree of consciousness. This microphone has just a pinch of consciousness. Bacteria, mice, and things like that have pinches of consciousness. And consciousness, according to panpsychism, is as much a part of the universe as is mass and energy. Now, any, any reactions to that? I, I don't see evidence of this. I don't know how you test whether my microphone has a piece of consciousness in it. I suspect you can talk about a mouse, for example, having a pinch of consciousness. I don't know. It's really outside of the field of engineering and computer science, so I'm not sure. But anyway, this is, this is a, big, um, a big deal uh, and one of the ongoing theories that people talk about. It's also one of the only theories you can go to if you're a materialist and you don't believe that there's anything outside the material universe then we must have consciousness for some reason. Well, maybe that's because everything is conscious to a degree because of panpsychism. There is another thing which is gaining popularity called integrated information theory, IIT. This is popularized by Christoph Koch of Caltech, K-O-C-H. And it's something which frankly, I don't understand. I did an interview with Gregory Chaitin. Remember Gregory Chaitin, the brilliant guy? And we were talking about, I said, you know, I've looked at integrated information theory and I don't understand it. And he said, I don't either. <laughs> this, was from, this was from Gregory Chaitin. I have it recorded too. So Gregory Chaitin doesn't know um, integrated information or he, he doesn't understand integrated information theory. And I think few people do. The only one that I'm aware of that really has talked to me about it is Summer Bringshore of Rensselaer. We talked about the Lovelace test due to Summer Bringshore. He understands this. But one of the things that they conclude from uh, integrated information theory is that consciousness cannot be computed. That is one of the assumptions. They start, they, they just observe properties of consciousness and try to generate a theory of consciousness from those properties. But there is no underlying root cause of consciousness which is presented. So that's very interesting. Uh, there's another one called quantum consciousness. Um, Roger Penrose, in talking about things such as creativity is non algorithmic, he went through the following, and I think this is, this is interesting. He said, you know, I'm a materialist. He was a naturalist. He believed that there was nothing beyond the material, if you will, even though all the strange things in quantum physics and relativity happened. He won the Nobel Prize last, I think it was last year. And um, I started to think, is there anything in the universe that isn't algorithmic? Because most of the things we can think of are algorithmic. If you think of Newton's laws, it's algorithmic. There's an equation. That equation is, a, is an algorithm. If you look at relativity or even quantum mechanics, you know, Heisenberg's equation or, um, uh, for example, in quantum mechanics, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's an algorithm. It lets you compute all of these probabilities. Uh, he said, so what's the only thing that is non-algorithmic in the universe that I can think of. The only thing he could think of, and the only thing I've ever been able to think of because he informed me about it, was quantum collapse. Are you familiar with a wave function? If you had quantum mechanics, a little bit of quantum mechanics, and the wave function existing, and then all of a sudden it collapses to one of a number of different states. Quantum mechanics is the foundation of quantum computing, which I know you've heard of. And the idea behind quantum computing is that 
a bunch of operations can be formed in these parallel possibilities. And then you should be able to collapse it in some sense to the proper solution. But he says this quantum collapse is, is totally um, non-algorithmic. So he believes that consciousness, creativity, and everything comes from quantum collapse in our microtubules, which are part of our neurons. Absolutely no evidence thus far. So this is kind of a, if you will, an, an algorithm of the gaps. So he thinks that that's the only case. That's the only thing, thing he could identify. So we do have some ongoing investigations of the origin of consciousness. And then there is mind-brain dualism, which is something that I subscribe to. Uh, you can't be a materialist, but there is growing evidence through things like near-death experiences, um, neurochemistry, that there is something happening beyond the brain. And that, as I used to think, everything in the brain was algorithmic. Everything could be deterministic, okay? It was following an algorithm. In fact, in interviews, I used to say, yes, artificial intelligence is possible because we have proof between our ears that that artificial, that that intelligence can exist and can be done using matter. But there is growing evidence that there are things happening external to the body. And, um, and these things happening external to the body means that the mind and the brain are connected, of course, but the mind is largely or partially external to the brain. There's something happening here. And there, there, there is a whole, uh, there's, there's a whole area of the philosophy of mind, which deals with this. In fact, I'm working now on editing a book on mind brain dualism with uh, Agnes Manuj. And he's, he's one of the great Christian philosophers. And, um, Brian Krauss, who is also a really great philosopher, and we're collecting chapters uh, supporting mind-brain dualism, both from computer science, neuroscience, um, um, neuroscience, uh, what's the other, oh, we, we have a brain surgeon that's writing a chapter, and um, so from all of these different areas, looking at different views that indeed dualism is a viable theory. And I think as time goes on, there is more and more evidence that there is mind-brain dualism, that the mind is external to the brain. And this, is, this gets into the non-algorithmic part. This is the chapter that me and Eric, Eric, Eric Holloway and I wrote for the book, which is that the mind is not the same as the brain, and that in order for, to explain the brain and the ability of the brain create, the ability of the brain to create, we would need incredible resources beyond the number of atoms in the universe. Mm -hmm. It's just so probabilistically low that this could happen by chance, that there is something there which is happening that gives us consciousness. So this is an ongoing area. Uh, again, I've told you my bias, which is mind-brain dualism. Uh, but quantum consciousness, I don't know. There's no experimental verification. Integrated information theory, it, it went through that hype curve that we talked about. Integrated information theory, it went really high. And then, it, whoa, there's kind of a depth of cynicism now. And it's unclear what the asymptote of reality is going to be for that also. So those are different things. Last thing I wanted to talk about is the AI church. If you are a theist, if you are a Christian or a Jew or even Muslim, uh, you you believe, well, as I believe, that if, if, you, if you have God removed, the true God removed, that man will create God, because it's such an inherent thing for us to do. And there is indeed an AI church which is growing up, which when you hear about, you will go, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yes, it is, but this is what comes out of a materialistic philosophy. Uh, one of the things that the AI church is trying to do is achieve immortality. How are they doing that? Well, they, they say we can upload our brains into a computer and live forever, right? Have you heard that? Now, this is assuming that the brain is totally algorithmic because you can only upload the algorithmic part of your brain. I maintain that if you just load, uploaded the, um, the algorithmic part, what would be, what you would have is something very boring. 
if it was just algorithmic U, I don't think that that would be too, too cool. Um, and but plus, uh, Christians know there's another way to achieve morality, immort immortality, right? They've taught this for years for for and the Jews, Jews have taught it for uh, three, four or 5,000 years. So that is something which both the AI church and the Christian church are pursuing is immortality. The other thing that is being pursued is super intelligence. This has a number of different terms. Um, the old term is hard artificial intelligence, wherein the computer, the AI, will duplicate capabilities of people. The new is artificial general intelligence. That's the new term being applied to it, which, which means basically the same thing. Artificial intelligence will be a super intelligence. And as we saw with quotes from people like um, Stephen Hawking, that they're afraid that as we get the super intelligence that it will write better and better AI programs and will soon leave people in the dust. And someday we will be the pets of artificial intelligence. Uh, this of course violates the observation that AI yet is to be creative because in order for AI to write a better set of software, what does that mean? It means it has to be creative, right? And if AI indeed has never been creative, never been shown to be creative via the Lovelace test so far, if AI is, um, if AI is, it, it can't be creative, then it can't write better and better programs unless that higher level program is put into the original program as a part of the program. And if it's put into the original program as the part of the part of the program, what does that mean? That means any creativity doesn't come from the AI, it comes from the programmer who put that AI capability into the software. So that's something that both, um, that, that's something that the AI church is attempting to achieve. Those of us who are Christian know that, well, no, it isn't, um, it isn't AI, and we already know of a super intelligence. And that super intelligence is the omnipotent, uh, uh, omnipresent God Almighty. So we already have a super intelligence. So you can see at least these parallel guidelines that AI and, say, Christianity are doing. Uh, there is a Bible, and the Bible was, uh, I would call it the singularity is near by Ray Kurzweil who also makes this prediction. He works for Google. He's a chief engineer for Google. And he made a prediction that very soon that AI is going to overtake us. And as soon as AI becomes superior to human beings, that will be the so-called singularity. And from then on, it's going to be AI doing everything. And that's his book. And the whole premise of his book, The Singularity is Near, it was, it was, a, best, uh, it was a bestseller. Now, I, I have an acquaintance named um, George Gilter who lives in the same neighborhood as Ray Kurzweil. He, he's, he's, a, he, he's a pretty wealthy guy, apparently. And uh, he says that in his talks with Ray Kurzweil, that Kurzweil is backpedaling a lot. So this idea of an AI singularity has reached the top of the hype curve and is starting to come down. And so people are kind of removing themselves from it. We have a uh, prophet. One of them is Yuval Harari. Anybody heard of Yuval Harari? No, he, he wrote this uh, best-selling book called Homo Deus. It also assumed Ray Kurzweil's prediction that humans would someday become the pets of AI. And he, he paints a very dystopian future, a very, very, very sad, very, very depressing future about the future of mankind once we are superseded by artificial intelligence. And there is an AI church apostle. That's Anthony Lewandowski. Now, he was the founder of the AI church way of the future. Now, who is A Anthony Lewandowski? He was an AI Silicon Valley wunderkind, wunderkind who worked for Google. It's either Google or Amazon. Okay. But he was, uh, he was known as kind of an expert and one of the founders of self-driving cars, which is another thing which has is, which is jumped the, uh, ju jump the uh, hype curve. But he literally wanted to find in California a church called an AI church. 
And he wrote an epistle. I don't know how you want to interpret it. It's either an epistle or kind of an apostle's creed for the AI church. This is what he wrote in his application to get non uh, tax-free status from the IRS. He wrote, the AI church believes in the realization, acceptance, and worship of a godhead based on artificial intelligence, AI, developed through computer hardware and software. What do you think of that? Any reactions to that? That's pretty extreme, right? But you notice how it ties in with this idea that, that uh, AI is someday going to take over man. And pretty soon, we are going to have a homo deus. Homo deus, I believe, translates to um, man god. Anybody know Latin? Is that right? Man god? Yeah. Okay. So, so everybody, all these people are, are falling into this materialistic uh, mindset in the AI church of the future of AI based on based on these uh, these assumptions. Now, one of the things about Lewandowski's church is Lewandowski Lewandowski's church did not have the equivalent of the Ten Commandments <laughs> because after he founded the AI church, what happened is that he was um, uh, he was arrested and charged with stealing trade secrets from Waymo, which I think was the Google arm, which was looking at self-driving cars, and then moving to Uber. He took a bunch of intellectual property and took it. One of the judges in his, that was over his case said, this is the biggest, the biggest case of intellectual property fraud he had ever seen in his life. So Lewandowski, who was the founder of the AI church, did not have 10 commandments on there interesting. And in his last day in office, Lewandowski was pardoned by Donald Trump. He was, he was pardoned because Lewandowski was a multimillionaire. You know, you don't go to, you don't go to Silicon Valley and be a wunderkind and not make millions and millions of dollars. So he was, he was promoted, at least according to one source, by uh, people such as Peter Thiel, who was the founder of PayPal, and was also a um, was also a Silicon Valley wunderkind. So he's out now. Lewandowski is out, and I don't believe that he has revived the AI church. The AI church. Okay, I, I want to go over this very very quickly. Um, I always say, I always maintain that saying the Bible is not a book about science is like saying a cookbook is not about chemistry. It doesn't, cookbook doesn't, isn't a book about chemistry. It isn't a textbook about chemistry, but certainly uh, it does contain chemistry. I think in the same sense, the Bible contains books on science. Here is a few things that if you are a Christian, you can take comfort in about the inability of founding AI found in the generation of um, a higher level artificial general intelligence. Um, and God blessed them and God said to them, have dominion over the fish of the sea and every living thing that moveth on the earth. This is, uh, this of course is referring to animals, but um, you know, does it refer maybe, can we generalize it to every other thing? Uh, that, my, that man has dominion over them. Psalms uh, 8, 6, you made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. And so this verse basically says that everything is under our feet. Um, and so it's not going to surpass us. There's also the philosophical question, can something create something which is greater than it? If God created man and man is inferior to God, can man create AI which is superior to man. In other words, it looks to be like a regress. I think this is an interesting, an interesting stance, but uh, nevertheless, it's compelling. There's also human exceptionality. Uh, God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him, male and female created he him. And also that we have the mind of Christ. I don't think AI will ever have the mind of Christ for, for Christianity. So there's something happening there with the soul and the spirit which is beyond the capability of AI. And also God is the sole source of life. We see a number of verses here where God is the only thing which gives life. 
And again, AI can probably duplicate a lot of the things that humans can do that are non-algorithmic, but it will never have a soul. It'll never be sentient, never understand, never have a spirit, never feel compassion, never pray, uh, won't have any of the exciting properties that we do that are non-algorithmic. Okay. <laughs> if you want a free ebook, uh, you can buy my ebook, The Case for Killer Robots. Lastly, I want to end with AI's biggest danger. Anybody want to guess what I think AI's biggest danger is? I don't think it's taking over mankind, as Yuval Harari and Ray Kurzweil say. I don't think that's the biggest danger. Can I uh, venture a guess? Sure. Uh, I think it would probably be um, giving people power over information, most importantly, fake information. So oh, being I, able to, I mean, it, it's already kind of weaponized. You see like online coordinated inauthentic behavior um, and you can, you can topple governments with that kind of false information. That's, um, that's, a, that, that's an excellent response, Colin. That wasn't what I had in mind, but certainly that is an enormous danger of artificial intelligence. Yes, absolutely. And we're seeing that now with the control of the media and things of that sort. Uh, fortunately, there is still this dissemination of freedom of speech in the United States, which hopefully will allow us to filter through this. And hopefully truth will win out. But that isn't always the case, is it? It isn't always the case. It's like, um, who was the Nazi head of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels? He said, in order to get people to believe a lie, you just have to tell it again and again and again and again. And that's, yeah, that's what, that's what we're seeing now. And these little, um, yeah, the, the, these little probes into, um, into taking control of society, gaining influence and making money. Anybody else? That's uh, that's that's a great answer. Yes. Well, my answer is that AI needs to do what it was designed to do. There will always be danger in AI. When electricity was invented, there was danger in electricity, right? And we've lived with it. Uh, even though houses still burn down from frayed wiring and linemen still get electrocuted, people still get electrocuted. So there remains a danger. The question is, is how best to mitigate it. So I think that the, big, the AI's biggest danger is unintended contingencies, especially with complex AI. I wrote a paper, in fact, it was with uh, Sam Haug here, on unintended contingencies increasing exponentially as the complexity of any system increases linearly. That means that if you increase the complexity of a, if you increase the complexity of uh, a system by a factor of four, well, let's see, can I do that? No, I can't, I can't give you a number. But as it increases linearly, the contingencies increase exponentially. And I, and sometimes that's okay. With my Alexa, that's okay. If, if I ask it to find out, get a job by the silhouettes, it was a doo-wop song of the 1950s, which I tried to do the other day. And I kept querying it with my voice. Give me, get a job by the silhouettes. And it would give me something like, uh, here is uh, get a job by, by Jay and the Bananas. And it was totally different than what I wanted. So I finally gave up on it. Anybody had similar things with Alexa? You just can't get out of it what you want. And so this, this is okay, but there's places where it becomes more and more serious. One of them, for example, was a couple of years ago, the Uber self-driving car that killed the pedestrian. Um, that was an unattended contingency. And, it, and the system at the point was, was a large one, a very complex system. And it turned out that three of the sub-modules, it was the imaging and the sensing and something else that conflicted and gave this false reading to the self-driving car, which ended up uh, killing people. And so again, that's, that's a big problem as the complexity increases linearly, the 
unintended or the contingencies increase exponentially. And they get so big, so quick that you can't keep track of them all. Possibly the most serious one was during the Cold War and the Soviets had just put into place this new complex system called OCO. And their idea was to detect incoming thermonuclear missiles from the United States. Now, this was during the Cold War. Everybody was on the edge of their seats waiting for the other side to attack. I lived through it. You didn't. It was, it was Cuban Missile Crisis, sort of, sort of rough. And one of the Russian, I think he was a lieutenant or a colonel, um, noticed that the OKU system, he was in charge at the time, the OKU system says, Russia is being attacked by US missiles. And then he waited a few minutes. He says, well, I don't want to just, I just don't want to attack based on that because there was just a few missiles that it detected. So later it said, four more missiles have been launched against the Soviet Union. Now, if the Soviet had responded the way it was supposed to, if the Soviets responded the way it was supposed to, it would have launched a counter thermonuclear strike against the United States. But the officer, the Russian officer in charge said, man, this just doesn't feel right. This just doesn't feel right. And he chose not to do it at, you know, at the threat of being reprimanded by his superiors. And it turned out he was right. Later, the Russians figured out that they had mistaken sun reflections off the cloud, off, off clouds as incoming missiles. So here was an unintended contingency from a relatively complex system that could have solved, that could have caused millions of deaths if that Russian army officer had not had a little bit of sense. So again, we have, we have a range of unintended contingencies, all the way from a Lexus to this OCO system and uh, being killed by self-driving cars. And sometimes they can be fixed, right? I think Alexa will probably get better and better and better. Self-driving cars used to be fooled by windblown plastic bags. They thought it was a cow running in front of them. But um, they, they were able to fix them, right? You can't fix it if you if you launch a thermonuclear strike or if you um, what, what's the other way if you launch a thermonuclear strike or you kill a pedestrian. Okay, that's that's not an acceptable way to learn how to improve your AI. So the unintended contingencies are the most difficult, and they become more and more prevalent as the complexity of the system increases. And that, to me, is a very dangerous. Uh, contingency, a very dangerous property of AI. Notice that in the pursuit of artificial general intelligence, that the complexity is going to be very, very, very large, right? It has to be a complex system. And so the number of contingencies is going to go whoop, it's going to go way up. And we're going to have a lot of unintended, unintended uh, consequences if we use artificial general intelligence. Why did I have this here, spam? Oh, I know, this is, this is one you can live with. Your spam filter is AI. And you know, if it doesn't get a spam every once in a while, that's fine. But if you're looking for thermonuclear attacks, you better be pretty certain that your result is gonna be good. So this is kind of in, uh, in summary of these three hours of talks that I've given. Uh, AI's greenest stranger, unintended consequences, self-driving cars, recognizing plastic bags, Uber self-driving cars, a goof that killed, Russia's Oku, a goof that could have cost millions of lives. And the common denominator as, as this increases is um, a complex system. So therefore, we have to find ways to mitigate complexity if we get more and more complex. You'll notice that most of the applications of AI are very narrow, right? They're very narrow, specific things. Um, I, I'm working with a student now, Justin Bowie, who does a lot of work on Kaggle and follows some of the contests they have here. And it turns out that as, how many have heard of Kaggle? 
Okay, couple, couple. Okay, it's it's a repository for data sets that you can use to train your artificial intelligence. It also sponsors a number of contests that you can enter. Whoever does the best in classifying this or that set of data is going to win. Um, but if you look at the solutions that they have in Kaggle, people are doing more and more specific things. Like in classification, they're not going to a general classifier to differentiate hogs and pigs. They are doing more specific things. They are doing the pre-processing of the pictures in order to make the AI more accurate. So it's getting more and more specific. It's not getting more and more general. And I don't believe that there's been any advance in the so-called general intelligence, artificial general intelligence. I think it's just been something in the mind of people that, um, that uh, should, uh, uh, should, should think more seriously about it and not live on journal papers and PowerPoint presentations, but actually go out and do it. This does bring up an important point, which is AI design ethics. We all know about AI ethics in general, but what is design ethics? Design ethics in general for engineers is that the system that you design should do what it was designed to do and no more. The system that you, you, you design should do what it was designed to do and no more. And this is the end goal of the, um, the design ethics. And you can apply different levels to this, much like you do in legal defense. For example, if somebody is going to be convicted of murder, it has to be, on, be beyond a reasonable doubt. You'll never get 100% of anything. But if you do beyond a reasonable doubt, then you know maybe if you have a self-driving car that will always work beyond a reasonable doubt, that that's acceptable. And then you have to define what a reasonable doubt is and design it accordingly. If you go into a civil case, you only have to have a preponderance of evidence, which is a much lower level of performance. A preponderance of evidence uh, would be that, uh, yeah, there's more evidence that it works than it doesn't. And I would say that that's applicable for AI like Alexa, right? Alexa, yeah, there's a preponderance of evidence that it, that it kind of works. Same thing for the spam filter. So these have to be something which, uh, which is addressed. It turns out that Pablo Rivas in our department, not in our department, in computer science department, is currently working with IEEE on standards to address AI ethics, including design ethics. So hopefully pretty soon we will have some guidelines on what to do with AI ethics uh, from IEEE. IEEE is a big mover and shaker in standards. And so this is gonna, some, this is gonna be something which, uh, which happens. Okay, self-driving cars, Uber self-driving cars, Rushers, Oku, uh, the common denominator here is the complex system. Okay, I've gone over there. So the takeaways from the talk, AI is neither good or bad. It's simply a tool. We have to remember that it's a tool, but it's a powerful tool. So is electricity. So is thermonuclear energy. We've lived with this stuff before. There's some people like um, Elon Musk said it's the it's the biggest um, it's the biggest threat to the existence of humanity. AI is no, it isn't. Thermonuclear bombs are probably a bigger threat, I think, than AI. Uh, another thing we did is talked about is beware of the hype because there's a lot of it out there. People want to get clickbait and get your attention. Uh, AI will exceed human capabilities in some cases, in others, never. Computers can add faster than I can. That's fine. They've, ex they've exceeded my capability there. With, um, with Wolfram Alpha, they can, they can solve differential equations and invert matrices faster than I can. MATLAB can invert matrices faster than I can. But everything that they can do better is algorithmic. AI will never be creative, understand, write better software, experience quiet, love, compassion, or empathy. These are non-algorithmic properties. They are unproven, but I think evidence is growing that indeed this is the case. And AI will probably never have common sense. There are things that humans do that AI will never do. 
And this, I'll end with Psalm 139, which says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And indeed, that's kind of the way we are. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, in some cases, currently beyond explanation. We don't know why. We don't understand about the source of creativity, other than it can't be a computer. And according to your ideology, you might go down different roads in order to, uh, in order to get there. Okay, I think that that's it. Um, oh my gosh, I have gone over time, haven't I? I, you know, and I wasn't monitoring my time, so I apologize, everybody. No, I don't. You enjoyed it, right? Uh, any questions or comments before we go? Is there anything you disagree with? I, I'd love to discuss that with you specifically because, like I said, a lot of this is um, my opinion. And it is, it, it is colored and biased by my ideology as a Christian. So um, I'm certainly open to counter arguments. One thing that uh, I kind of have a question about, uh, and it's not really a direct disagreement or anything, uh, is that um, I personally tend to be a little bit more skeptical of like saying for certain that these are the things that AI can and cannot do. Just right. because like the reason that AI has taken off in the past like two to three to four decades is primarily just the, the scale we've been able to apply to these systems like GPT-3, like the concept and algorithms are relatively simple, um, but sort of the, the magic tends to happen when you scale it up and, um, you know, throw even more data at it. Um, but yes. like, you know, most like machine learning problems you see on Kaggle competitions, like you're only training on a very domain specific data set. You're not giving it like a whole, like us as human beings are trained on decades of experience. And if you were to put a number on how many bytes of data we take in, it's, it's immense. Um, and how much data we're able to filter out that's that's just random noise. Um, well, here, no, you're exactly right. I think that the acceleration of the performance and the jaw-dropping response of AI has been due exactly, like you said, to the increase of computational complexity. However, there is something called the Church-Turing thesis, named after Alonzo Church and uh, Turing. I think, was it you that mentioned to me, Colin, Lambda Calculus? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Lambda Calculus was invented by Alonzo Church, and Alan Turing came up with the Turing machine, and they showed that actually Turing came to the U.S. and worked with Alonzo Church, and uh, they found out that both of them were kind of equivalent in, in some sense, and uh, as a result of that comes out the idea of uh, Turing complete things, and um, and the conclusion, the remarkable conclusion, is that no computer can do any more than the Turing machine that Turing did. Now, today's computers can do it a billion, a trillion times as faster. But nevertheless, they are still constrained. And if you can show something is not possible with a Turing machine, it translates to today's machines, no matter how how big they are, how fast they're going, whatever. So that means whatever supercomputer you have, you are not going to be able to address the, um, you're not going to be able to solve the, the halting problem. It just, it's not possible no matter what you do. So there are limitations and some of those limitations of the original Turing machine is, um, are, are applicable today. So, I guess that would be my, my response. And, and the question is, is can we carry that out? Again, I'll admit that a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is was speculative. I, I, well, it's speculative, but I, I'm pretty convinced of it. And I think is uh, something that which is certainly defendable. And I think that there's no counter evidence to it. We will see in the future. There's also the argument that as complexity and, and computer power increase, that all of a sudden there's going to, this is a common argument, which you've probably heard of, there's going to be an emergence of consciousness, there's going to be an emergence of creativity. Uh, this is, reminds me of the, um, did I talk about the Christmas pony in here? Okay, they, 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 they were testing about the optimization the optimization, why this little boy was so optimistic. It was, he was optimistic beyond any, any, any imagination. 
So they said, we need to test this, see if we can break his optimism. So they put him in a room full of horse manure and they closed the door and watched him through a one-way glass. And the boy went to the horse manure and he looked at it and he got a big smile on his face and he started grabbing the manure and throwing it over his shoulder and digging. And, and they finally came in after a while and they said, what's, what's, what's the deal here? He says, with all this horse manure, there must be a pony in here somewhere. Now, the reason I tell that joke is because that is the way that I view people who say that we are going to have this emergence from, um, from computers as they get more and more complex. There have been people that have studied artificial life, for example, and, oh, what's his name? Kaufman, for example. Uh, you know, not, not a deist, not a theist. But Kaufman came to the point where he says, you know, there's something happening in life that just cannot be explained by artificial life. So they're coming to the same conclusion that, you know, that, that we are. So that's my, that's my two-point response. One is that uh, the church Turing thesis, that if we, nothing's going to solve the halting problem. Nothing is going to solve the non-algorithmic point. The second one is more philosophical, and it's saying that just because we have more computational power, uh, we are not going to see things like emergence of consciousness and emergence of other things that magically come out. So um, Kaufman studied a lot of this. I, we, we talked about the game of life before. Uh, there's something called the, uh, the what? The uh, dust? I think it's the, I forget what it is, where, where, where you choose a bunch of pixels at random to start to initiate your game of life. Most of them die out, but the rest that's left are very, very simple. And it doesn't matter how you, how you see the, the game of life, you still get this reduction to simplicity. And Kaufman has abandoned this. There was also a guy named, um, oh boy. I wanna say Linsky, but that wasn't his name. So uh, one thing with regards to that, the game of life, like the, the game itself is actually Turing complete. It is, yes. Um, so yeah, you don't get reduction to simplicity. There are some, it shows that there are actually some starting configurations that are actually, you can't predict the- What's the problem, what's, what's the chance of that happening though? I mean, yeah, you, you could make the, the same argument of like, you know, maybe the, like, what's the chance of even a human being able to, to solve a, an undecidable problem? That's, you know, that, that, that's, that's an important, that, that's an important point, yeah. because even though we know that the halting problem is, is not algorithmic, we also know that we can't solve a halting problem. We can't look at a computer program and say whether it halts or goes on forever. So yeah, that is a, uh, that, that's a bump in the road for the, for the halting problem. I agree with you. Yeah. So excellent comments. Oh boy, Tierra. You familiar with Tierra? Tierra was a program written by, and the the, the author escapes my my idea now. But he wanted to write a computer program wherein not only you had um, emergence, but you could have the evolution of emergence. I do a lot of work in evolutionary computation, which is a good engineering tool for designing things. But um, um, the emergence of optimization, or, I'm sorry, the emergence of optimization. Um, emergence uh, doesn't happen evolutionary wise. It has to be supplied with something called active information. You can't get something to work. You can't get self-organization. You can't. Uh, you can't get. Um, you can't get results. You can't get this emergence without an external source in the computer program supplying the information to guide you there. It's simply not possible. There is not enough atoms in the universe. The paper that I just wrote with uh, Eric Holloway takes the universe and it divides it into Planck cubes. You know what a Planck unit is? Planck unit is so small. That's where you, you get string theory. You know, you, it's about the level of a string. And that is so small that if you took a Planck length and you increased it to an inch, the diameter of a proton would be, I think it was five light years. It would be incredibly large. 
So divide the universe into Planck cubes. And then we're going to take the history of the universe measured from the Big Bang, and we're going to define that by Planck time. Planck time is the time that it takes light to travel one Planck length. Now you'll notice that is an incredibly large number. Do you agree? I mean, I don't know anything more physical that you could have uh, describing a large number. But even one chance in that big number is insufficient to uh, generate true creativity. And maybe later in the course, we can talk about that. But yes, it is possible, but there is something called Borel's law, which says that when things become so improbable, if they become so improbable that they're beyond reason, they, are, they become impossible. For example, um, uh, Ming Kun is sitting there. There is a finite chance that he will quantum tunnel through his chair. Do you agree? But that probability is so small that we say, no, it's impossible. And when you talk about these things, the, the, this idea of increased computer speed, then, um, or increased computer power, you have to address things like that. One other thing, which I'll probably address, and then we should probably cut it off because I've really gone really long here. Uh, suppose that you have the ability to uh, search through a problem and you're able to search through a million bits all of the different million bits, able to do an exhaustive search for all the million bits. So you go zero, 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 and then zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero. So you can, you can do it all. And suppose it takes you a year. You double the speed of the computer. It's kind of like a Moore's law. You double the speed of a computer. If you double the speed of the computer, instead of a million bits, how many bits can you go through? A million and one, because you have to you have, you have to check the original original million bits with the first new bit set to zero. Then you have to check the million bits with the new bit set to one. So therefore, the scaling of computational ability is um, is pretty. You know that that in itself is pretty rough. So we see all of this exponential. We see Borel's law applying to the creation of this thing by chance. Is it possible? Yes, but maybe about the same as I think I mentioned being struck by space debris while you're juggling. Okay. Dr. Marks? Yes. Uh, are you familiar with like the, the theory of sort of NP completeness and that, that yes. class of problems? Yes. So, anyways, there's a class of problems that are called NP complete. Yes. There's a P versus NP conjecture, you can, you can look it up. Um, I actually did my- The, the uh, which, the which uh, conjecture? Uh, P and P conjecture. Whether, whether they're the same. Uh, yeah, or the yeah. conjecture, they're, they're not the same, or at least we hope they're not the same. Okay, yeah. but, but it, it remains unproven. Yeah, um, I did, a, in my undergrad, I did some work. Um, my, my undergrad thesis was on the, the satisfiability problem, which is um, if you basically give, it's essentially like logic or propositional logic theorem proving. Uh, so if you give a computer some logical theorem, uh, can it actually prove whether it's, it's true or not? Oh, you can. You can, yeah. You can, um, you can. There, there is software now which checks through the logical steps and validates whether your proof is right or wrong. Now, that same computer you think could be used for a random search to, to solve some of these very difficult problems like the gold box conjecture. Nobody has done that yet. And, and, and the problem is so incredible that it probably can't be done. Yeah, well, it, it actually can be done. Um, so like, if you look at uh, modern SAT solvers, um, like they can solve, so there's, if you Google the, uh, have you heard of the, uh, the Boolean Pythagorean triples problem? No, I haven't, I haven't heard of that. One. So this is kind of fascinating. So uh, there was the, the super, there's a supercomputer at uh, UT Austin that basically ran this uh, relatively large program. And they're basically trying to prove an unproven result uh, from Ramsey theory, uh, which is a theory of mathematical structures. It's a little more in the weeds. Um, but basically the theorem statement is if you take all of the integers uh, and you paint them red and blue, is there any painting of red and blue to all the integers such that uh, no Pythagorean triple is all red or all blue? Okay, I, I th that, that does ring a bell, okay. Yeah, so 
uh, essentially they were able to compile this down into a large logical formula and uh, you see they throw were it at able to compile it down where did that creativity come from um so i mean a lot of it's i wouldn't even call it very creative um well, it's, like, it's it's setting up it's setting up the dominoes. Look, we're gonna we're gonna have to call it a day. I see yeah. some eyes glazing over, so I All think right. uh, we should probably end it. Thank you guys, and thank you for your patience. I'll try to be better next time. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you.